have a lot of exciting things to cover in this video, including the step-by-step -step instructions on how to make a better pizza at home, starting with the dough, its ingredients, its hydration, the long fermentation and its benefits, the right temperature for baking, and to make our homemade pizza even better, we're going to add tangchong or yudane to the dough. Now, you may ask, how is tangchong or yudane going to improve our homemade pizza? Essentially, tangchong or yudane helps the dough in retaining its moisture during and after baking. And at the right percentage, properly made tangchong or yudane that has been left for a while, like in the fridge overnight or up to 24 hours, brings out more of that natural flavor, more of that natural sweetness. And we will be relying on these advantages in our quest to achieve homemade pizzas baked in an electric oven that have some specific characteristics that we love in pizzas baked in a wood-fired brick oven. That delicate and soft cornichon, its crispy crust, and the chewy sensation of its crumb. All of this, not to mention the delicious toppings, are what we have come to expect of a pizza from a professional pizzeria. We're trying to replicate this at home, but here's the issue. If you've tried baking pizza at home before, you may have noticed that there's something amiss about homemade pizza. And one thing that stands out to be the hardest challenge to overcome is getting that crispy, yet delicate and soft crust rim, the cornichon. Cornicione. This is the part that we tried and tried to achieve and never properly got right. And that, I believe, is where tangchong or yudane can play an important role. We did numerous experiments with making pizza at home and we have come to the conclusion that raising the dough's hydration and adding sufficient tangchong or yudane can improve our homemade pizza tremendously. Raising the hydration lessens the impact of evaporation due to longer baking time by simply giving the dough more water to start with. While tangchong or yudane steps in to retain that moisture and eventually give us that delicate and soft texture that we're looking for. So let me explain. The traditional way of making pizza limits the hydration of the dough to between 55 to 59 percent. This relatively low hydration dough is then baked in a wood-fired brick oven at a temperature between 300 to 400 degrees Celsius, usually for about one to two minutes. Baking at such a high temperature for a short period of time enables the pizzeria to bring out pizzas with all the characteristics that we mentioned before. A soft texture on the crust rim, chewy, and at the same time, crispy. Now, here's the main problem if we try to replicate this at home the baking temperature. Home ovens usually can't go into the range of 300 to 400 degrees Celsius, the range of temperature used in most pizzerias. Standard home ovens have the upper limit set to between 250 degrees Celsius to 290 degrees Celsius. A lower temperature range means a longer baking time, and a longer baking time translates into an additional loss of moisture through prolonged evaporation. When done baking, our pizza crust is crisp and dry, Crunchy maybe, but not soft or delicate. So we end up with something like a rustic, crispy flatbread, but very dry, instead of the ideal foldable pizza with a crispy and delicate cornichon. So it's natural to try raising the pizza dough's hydration to address this issue. Well, the dough ends up moister, but as anyone who has baked artisan breads over and over again can tell you, the higher the hydration, the more open the crumb is. So you do not get a delicate crumb, the indicator of a soft texture. So we get a crispier, moister pizza with a more open crumb, but it's still far away from the ideal pizza that we're trying to imitate. That's when tangchong or yudane enters the scene. So as I've mentioned before in my previous videos on this subject, at the core of tangchong or yudene is starch gelatinization. The addition of gelatinized starch has a significant effect on the pizza, but it doesn't work in quite the same way as sugar or fat does to soften a bread. Sugar attracts water, making it easier for the bread to retain moisture, while fat has a large impact on gluten. It coats the strands, preventing them from linking up, thus resulting in a finer and softer texture due to the weakened gluten network. Traditionally though, pizza dough doesn't call for adding sugar or fat. It's a lean dough through and through, and sugar or fat can heavily influence the taste of the pizza. Adding tangchong or yudane is different. 
because it helps the dough retain moisture through a different mechanism that doesn't mess with the original taste as much. And as shown in this paper, the addition of tangzhong or yudene changes the crumb structure to a relatively small degree, albeit still being statistically significant. What makes this interesting is the change tangzhong or yudene makes to the wall surface of the pores of the crumb grain. Without tangzhong or yudane, the control breads have their walls lined with melted starch granules that are in contact with each other. With tangzhong or yudane, these melted starch granules are buried under the gelatinized gel. As I've explained in my previous video, the melted starch granules are the result of exposing starch granules to high temperatures, usually above 100 degrees Celsius, under limited water content, which is the typical condition of bread baking. For the control breads during baking, the gas pressure gradually builds up within this wall, it then cracks at a temperature near the melting temperature of the starch granules. The gas pressure is subsequently contained by the external crust, which results in a uniform gas pressure among all gas cells under the thick bread crust. During this process, the moisture within the dough evaporates gradually. The longer we bake, the more moisture evaporates. While tangzhong or yudane breads do not have as much gluten as the control ones, from these images of the same paper, we see that the gluten fibrils of a properly made tangzhong or yudane bread are significantly thicker and rougher. These images also show that the starch granules eluded from the surface of a core wall of tangzhong or yudane breads they're visually different when compared to a similar pore wall of the control breads, where the starch granules are still clearly visible. So, in conclusion, adding tangzhong or yudane makes the contact between gelatinized starch granules and the gluten network weak. This could be due to the unsuccessful formation of the gluten starch complex. The lack of gluten networks are compensated by a more flexible starch wall that eliminates the detrimental surface layers of starch granules, such as those of the control breads. All this gives tangzhong or yudane breads their capabilities in retaining more moisture. And when we bite them, we get that soft feeling despite having a crumb structure that is practically as open as regular breads. So with all that information out of the way, let's actually make our amazing pizza. So first off, we'll prepare the tangzhong or yudane, whichever you'd prefer to call it. So prepare 120 grams of boiling water and pour it into a mixing bowl. Make sure that it's really hot because we're directly adding 60 grams of bread flour to it next. If the water isn't hot enough, it won't be able to properly gelatinize the flour. So make sure it's the right temperature. I'm using a wooden rolling pin. You could use any heat resistant tool. It should just take a few minutes. Now you can actually use this right after it cools, but as I've said before, leaving the tangzhong or yudane overnight or up to 24 hours can have benefits. It can bring out more of that natural sweetness, which will make our pizza taste a lot better. So I'm putting this in the fridge for up to 24 hours, making sure to cover it so it doesn't dry up too much. All right, once the tangzhong's ready, it's time to make the final dough. We'll take our tangzhong, scrape it into a large mixing bowl. Then we're gonna add 105 grams of water, nine grams of salt, and a quarter of a teaspoon of instant yeast. We're adding these three first to allow them to dissolve and mix with the tangzhou. Then we're gonna add the final ingredient, 240 grams of bread flour. It's important to use bread flour here because a portion of the total flour has already gone to the tangzhou or yudane. The proteins in that mixture have already been practically denatured, so we need this extra protein here to make up for it. And that's it for the ingredients. This is a lean dough recipe, so no extra ingredients. Instead, we're relying on long fermentation to add flavor and complexity to the pizza. That's why we're using a pretty minimal amount of yeast. Well, the overnight tangzhong or yudane will improve the flavor as well. We're now going to mix all these ingredients well. 
making sure there aren't any loose bits of flour. Just keep mixing it until everything is homogeneous and well hydrated. Then we're gonna start kneading it. It's pretty sticky to start with, but should get a little better after it's developed some gluten. We wanna knead it by just using this straightforward back and forth kneading motion. Don't use too much strength when working the dough. That's just gonna make it a sticky mess. Remember to stretch it out and then pull it back. We're gonna knead it for about five minutes until the dough is well combined and looks smoother. After five minutes, the dough is still probably going to be a bit sticky, but that's okay. We, we're now going to leave this dough be for another 20 minutes. Give it time to relax and absorb some of that water. So just cover it, and this is just a short break. Okay, so after 20 minutes have passed, we'll first use just a little bit of oil in our hands and the dough to prevent it from sticking. Then we're gonna use the slap and fold method now. So pulling it up, letting it stretch, and then folding it down. We wanna do this until it's smooth and cohesive this time, which shouldn't take too long, just a few minutes or a couple of slap and fold. Just quickly moving the dough up and down. It's already come together and it looks very good. So just to make sure that it's really done, we're gonna do a quick window pane test. So just stretching out a small piece and there you can see the light through it, so it's good. Okay, so we're gonna round it into a nice even shape. Next, we'll use a little bit of oil to line this bowl where the dough will rest in. Then we're gonna round the dough up and place it into the bowl. We'll cover it with the oil, tidy it up, and finally, we'll let it properly bulk ferment for one hour or until it doubles in size. Now, the timing for this bulk fermentation may vary depending on your room temperature, so be sure to keep an eye on your dough. Once the dough is done bulk fermenting, we're gonna go straight to the next step, which is to divide the dough. So make sure to prepare enough flour to dust the work surface and your hands, as well as prepare for the dough later too. We'll take out our dough. Even it out a little into a round bowl. Just some quick motions. Then with the help of the scale, we're going to divide this dough into four dough balls since it makes four small pizzas. You could divide it as you like though, really. We're making it into four just for convenience. Using our trusty bench scraper, we'll cut directly into the dough. Make sure to use a bit of flour in case of any sticking. This dough is not extremely sticky, but it can certainly make a mess if you don't use enough flour. Weigh each piece and make sure they're even. Next, we'll round each piece of the dough well by first pulling the edges in until we have a tight ball before using our hands to further round them. We really wanna make sure that they're as taut, round, and smooth as they can be. That's going to really help us when we shape them later. Repeating the same steps for every piece of dough. And after this, we're going to let these dough balls ferment for a second time. Now, we're actually gonna leave two out on the countertop and put the other two dough balls into individual bowls. The two on the counter will cover them and let them ferment at room temperature for about one and a half an hour. The two in the bowls, we're gonna put into the fridge to ferment overnight, of course, covering them well. We're only gonna be making two pizzas right now and we're saving the rest for later. This recipe is actually very flexible with timing. You can just 
follow the recipe until this second fermentation, then store the pizza in the fridge and continue with the rest of the recipe later. You can even freeze the dough to store it and it's pretty convenient that they're already divided so you can just pop one out and quickly make a pizza by following the rest of the recipe. Now, while we're talking about the second fermentation, you've probably noticed that we're giving the second fermentation a lot more time than the first bulk fermentation. And that's because we really want the dough to relax and ferment before we shape it. Pizza dough is pretty different from bread dough, and we really want a relaxed dough that we can easily stretch out for pizzas. So, okay, for the pizzas undergoing fermentation at room temperature, about 25 minutes before they're done, we'll start preheating our oven, since after shaping, the pizzas will go immediately in. We want to preheat it to as hot as the oven will go, which for our oven is 250 degrees Celsius. We're also preheating the baking pan the pizzas will be on top of. Note that it's on the top row of the oven. This is to get the pizza exposed to as much heat as we can so we get the really crisp crust. Okay, the dough's second fermentation is done. We can immediately start shaping the dough. Prepare a good amount of flour. We're actually mixing some semolina flour with regular wheat flour here just to prevent sticking. Again, this is pretty different from bread. You will be stretching the dough out. You don't want it to stick anywhere. Make sure to dust your hands and the work surface well. Now, as for the specific technique of stretching the pizza dough, here's what I like to do. First, we'll get the pizza dough ball out, flip it and coat it well with flour on both sides. Then using our fingers, we're gonna press into it starting at about an inch from the bottom, continuing forward until about an inch from the top. This is just to spread it out a bit more. We'll rotate the dough 90 degrees before doing the same thing as before. Continue this until the dough has been stretched out a bit. Then we're going to further stretch it out using this method. So press and stretch the dough out using our hands, using the sides of our hands, moving around the dough's edge. This can take a bit of practice to get good at, but it's not that tricky and should stretch the pizza out well. We could also um, use our knuckles to stretch the pizza out like so, by pulling it up, resting it on knuckles before moving our hands around the pizza. Keep doing this until the dough is a thin and even sheet. Now, shaping pizza dough is a little bit of an art and can take some time to get the hang of. So in the meantime, if you make a mistake and see any holes, you can patch them up just by layering the dough over and pressing down. Add a bit of flour to prevent sticking and it should be okay. We're gonna coat the dough with a lot of flour to prevent sticking and we're gonna put it on the peel and now that it's done, we're gonna immediately top it. So you can top the pizzas with whatever you like. I'm using a simple homemade tomato sauce along with some nice mozzarella cheese. Then it's time for baking. We're baking them one by one for around 12 minutes or until the crust looks dark brown. The key to baking pizzas in a home oven is actually to bake them for as hot a temperature as possible for as short a time period as you can. This is because home ovens typically can't reach the extremely high temperatures of traditional wood-fired brick ovens. We want to get that crisp crust without sacrificing too much moisture so we get a nice crisp but flexible pizza, not a hard and dense one. This is the best way we've found to do that with our oven. Depending on your oven type, your settings and conditions may vary, so be sure to experiment around for the best results. And when the pizza looks like this, it's done. We're gonna take it out of the oven, put it on a wire rack, and now we can finally feast. And we'll repeat the same steps for the second pizza, toppings, and then into the oven. And that's it for today. Thanks for watching and bye.